Welcome to the Great Detectives of Old Time Radio from Boise, Idaho. This is your host, Adam Graham. If you have a comment, email it to me at box13 at greatdetectives.net. Uh, give me a call. The number is 208-991-4783. And uh, be sure and fill out our listener survey, survey.greatdetectives.net. Uh, I do want to encourage you, if you've not already, pick up a, bo- a copy of my ebook. All I Needed to Know, I Learned from Columbo. Uh, it's available uh, in most uh, ebook formats, uh, including the Kindle, and uh, you can also uh, purchase it at smashwords.com. In the book, we take a look at the uh, careers and history of seven great detectives of radio, television, and literature, including Sherlock Holmes, Nero Wolf, Monk, and uh, Boston Blackie. It's available now for $1.99. All right, well, now it's time for today's episode of Pete Kelly's Blues. Uh, Zelda, I should note that there were quite a few lost episodes between last week's show and this week's. Uh, there was a repeat, they actually did, rerunning Vera Brand on week six of the program. This week's show comes from week 10. It's from September the 5th of 1951, and the title is Zelda. This one's about Pete Kelly. It's about the world he goes around in. It's about the big music and the big trouble in the big 20s. So when they ask you, tell them this one's about the blues. Kelly's Blues. Pete Kelly's Blues, starring Jack Webb, with story by Joe Eisinger and music by Dick Kepka. Four seventeen Cherry Street, Kansas City. It's a standard speakeasy. The ceiling is low, the prices are high, and the whiskey is cut more times than a chin at a barber college. The entrance is just wide enough to handle one at a time, vertical or horizontal. My name's Pete Kelly. I play cornet. We start every night about ten, and we play till the last buck is home safe in Lupo's cash register. George Lupo owns the lease. He's a fat, friendly little guy. You can always count on for a 20 in exchange for two tens. But that's all right. He lets us play the kind of music we like, and every once in a while, he'll let us duck out to make a couple of phonograph records. All he asks is that we're back in an hour and 15% of the take. Well, last night, Matty Wynn had been after us for two weeks to make another record for him, to fill out one side. Matty ran a two-turntable recording joint in a loft over on Baltimore. During the day, he'd keep busy making two-buck personal records for the folks to send back home to the farm. At night, he'd rope a combo like ours to put out with some Dixie for the local market. We'd already pressed a few for his label under different names. The Spickardsville Sparks, the Grundy Growlers, the KC Cats. Maybe you got one or two in your collection. Hold on to them. They're pure. Well, it was getting on to 11 when I pushed the tempo on the last number in the second set. Lupo glared at us as we hustled out, packed up our instruments, we piled into a taxi in Red's Erskine Coupe and slammed out for Baltimore Street and Maddie's Loft. Come on, I'll help you with the fake. All right, all right, let's keep it light, huh? This is a residential district now. Hold it down, boys, huh? Hold it down. Hey, fellas, quiet down now. 
Quiet. Pete? Who's that, Red? Looks like Zelda. Oh, Pete, I'm so glad I didn't miss you. Yeah, Zelda. I have to... Could I talk to you for a minute, Pete? All right, what's on your mind? Alone? I got a recording date, Zelda. I know, Pete. That's why I came here. We have to get back to 417. A minute, Pete? A half a minute. All right. Okay, Petey, we'll wait upstairs. All right, you guys, let's move. And Pete. Yeah, Red. We don't sound like much out of corn there. Make it snappy, huh? All right. I inside, Mo. Okay. Thank you, Pete. All right, come on, Zelda. Don't be mean, Pete. I've had my share of meanness. The way the newspaper... What did you expect? Rave notices for the way you divorced Maddie to marry a hood like Johnny April? I have a right to live my own life. Sure, no matter whose life you kick the shreds doing it. I love Johnny. He loves me. Oh, Pete, of all people, I thought you would understand that you would... Now, look, Zelda. I like a guy named Matty Wynn. In my book, he didn't rate the kind of treatment you dealt him. You like a guy named Matty Wynn? How much do you really know All right, about... Zelda, just funnel this down. Now, what do you want? Matty refuses to see me, Pete. That figures. I want you to talk to him for me. Saying what? Well, Matty, you always got on well together. He may listen to now, you. Now, look, Zelda, I got a job to do. Get to it. Matty's got a record that belongs to me. I want it. What kind of a record? It's, it's a record you and the boys made once. June night. Now, you're beginning to make a lot of sense, Zelda. You'll understand, Pete. Just tell him I... I'll give him anything he wants for the record. You just tell him that, Pete. If you talk to him, maybe he'll... Now, listen. look, Zelda, just for the book here... I never liked you much. I know. I think I... you were grief for Matty from the first day he met you until the day you dealt him the final foul. All right, now, why don't you just leave him alone? For Matty's sake, believe me, Pete, for his sake, I must have that record. And if you're a friend of his, Pete, you'll advise him to give it to me. All right. I don't know what you want with an old disc of mine, but if it's something you need, it's something Matty's better off without. I think you deserted us for the Mount City I just left Zelda. Of course, the wisest thing any man could do. She is waiting for me downstairs. Why is it, Pete, that we always assume the vulture to be male? Right, you seem more like a frightened rabbit. Zelda, rabbit? Mink, yes, but never rabbit. All right, Matty, I'll tell you about it after the session, huh? All right, let's get it on the road, huh? Matty, what do you want us to do? Well, you've just got one side to fill. Last time you did me singing the blues, we never did get a good take on Dixieland one step. Okay, all right, come on, guys. Let's like each other, huh? Right, quiet down, quiet down. All right, let's do Dixieland one step. How you want a routine, Petey? Well, let's see, like this. Everybody going in. Nick, plug those brakes solid. Uh, Matt Lock, you take the first little break on clarinet. Yeah. And Mo, you take the second and really blow it out, huh? Give me a. And deep. everybody in on the first chorus, huh? Yeah, that's right. And I'll take it for sixteen. Matt Lock, you take sixteen. Everybody out. Good and bright, huh? Yeah, okay. All right. Ready, Matty? Just a second. Okay, take it on the count, huh? All right. Now here we go. Four, three, two, one. Ha, ha, ha. 
good, huh? Yeah, it was good for me. Bye, Matlock. Matty? That does it, Pete. All right, you can pack up. I'll see you back at 417, huh? Hello, boys. You stand behind, Pete? Yeah, ten minutes. Leave the Erskine for me, will you, Red? Sure. Look, Pete, you come here to take care of your business. Leave it that way, huh? Don't worry, Red. I aim to. Will you take my horn? Yeah. I'll see you later. All right. Nice, Pete. One solo seems a little long for time, but I think we can get it all on. Look, Matty, I know this is probably none of my business. The papers and her marriage to Johnny April has made Zelda everybody's business. Well, she asked me to talk to you about a record. Indeed. An old one of ours, June night. Yeah, June night. I remember it well, Pete. I always considered it a splendid achievement in jazz that should one day become a collector's item. Zelda doesn't know jazz from German measles and cares less, but she said she'd give you anything you want for that record. You can tell Zelda that she can purchase a copy of June Night at Lambert's for 35 cents. Yeah, that's why I don't get it. And if you're fortunate, Pete, you never will. Give me, Pete, I don't mean to be sharp with you, but you're young and carefree. Stay that way. And if Zelda should again approach you, take a trip around the world to someplace else but go. All right, Maddie, she asked me to ask you, and I ask. Good night. Good night, Pete. Kelly? Who wants to know? Hear that, Perry? He wants to know who wants to know. All right, I'll tell you. I want to know. Feel better? Sure, I'm Pete Kelly, but I got a right... And I got a left. Let's ride. Thanks, but I got my own car here. Right now, ours is safer for you. It's bulletproof. Well, I was going to tell him I didn't need a bulletproof car. He showed me the gun. It was a forty-five. I know how to admit it when I'm wrong. So we got into the bulletproof car. During the ride, I cased the two artillerymen. Except for their faces, I'd seen them a couple of times before. At 417, over at Sour Sammy's, at Fat Annie's. The same tightly tailored blue suits, the same long, itchy fingers, and the same razor-edged lips and eyes. Oh, there's hundreds of them around. But they're pretty right guys. You gotta know how to handle them. Just do as they tell you, and the chances are you won't lose more than one eye. Well, the car glided to a smooth stop in front of the Roxbury Apartments. The private elevator shot us up to the penthouse. My stomach caught up with me as the Gunsels pushed me into a living room that was slightly smaller than Swope Park, but less crowded. One man, all shoulders, no hips, and rich black hair, a face that would make Wally Reed cut his throat. He was sitting at a table with earphones on. He was tuning a radio. He glanced once over his shoulder at me. I didn't jump more than 20 yards was Johnny April. Just a minute. I've been listening to something good on the earphones. Here, I'll plug in the speaker for you. Ah, you hear that music? Yeah. Nice reception, huh? Yeah. Just got it. 12-tube superheterodyne, Magnavox horn. Pulls in Frisco without static. The best. Drink? No, no thanks. You sure? I'm sure. Canadian import, the best. You sure you want number one? Yeah, Sure. Well, luck. Luck. Yeah, it's good stuff. Got a jolt, the best. You know who I am? Yeah. You sure? Sure. What's my name? April. Johnny April. That's right. You know my wife? Your wife? My wife. Yeah? You sure? Yeah. Mrs. April. Don't you know her better than that? Than what? Than Mrs. April? Well, huh? Well, sure. I know her. I, I knew her when she... Well, before she... When she was married to Maddie Wynn? Yeah. But you didn't call her Mrs. Wynn, did you? Well, I... No. What did you call her? By her name? Which is... Zelda. Zelda, that's right. That's all I wanted to fix. Now we both know what we're talking about. Zelda. You understand now? Yeah. That's why I invited you here to talk about Zelda. And why you're bothering her. Well, you lost me, Mr. April. Not a bad suggestion, but first I want you to tell me what you and Wynn are clubbing Zelda with. You're asking me to play without a cue sheet, Mr. April. I don't even know the tune. Tonight you stopped Zelda on Baltimore Street. You talked to her on a corner. You were seen. She was pleading with you. Now, look, Mr. April, you're spinning it backwards. She stopped me, asked me to speak to Wynn. About what? Well, about a record she said belongs to her. What record? Well, it's a record. One that I made for Wynn. It's called the title. Yeah, I know. This sounds silly, but it's true. Half right, Kelly. It sounds silly because it isn't true. What do you want with Zelda? All right, April. You take it any way you like. All I want from Zelda is distance between us. Now, I got a date to play. Jake, teach him. What are you and Wynn cooking? Nothing. What do you want from Zelda? Nothing, I tell you. Johnny, Johnny, what are you doing? This the crumb who stopped you tonight? Yeah, he's the one. 
How much did Wynn pay April to take Angel off his hands? <laughs> what did he want? Money. Yeah, he said he and Wynn would make trouble for me, for you. What kind of trouble? My divorce, about my divorce. Open it up again unless I paid them. All right. Now listen to me, Tenhorn. You got luck. You got lots of luck. You should light a candle to your luck. Next time you fill a ditch. This time I only warn you. And these are the warnings on the way. Tomorrow morning, 9 o'clock, you go to Union Station. You buy a ticket, east, west, north, or south. You go. You go till the train runs out of the rails. No more room for you in Kansas City. Only in that ditch. You hear me? I hear you. Well, Jake and Perry drove me back to the Erskine. They dropped me on Baltimore. I sat on the curb, my head between my knees. After a while, I felt a little better. I could breathe again. The lights were still on up in Matty's loft. He was probably working on the master. While I navigated the long flight of stairs, trying hard to hold back the sudden anger kicking up in me. It wasn't Matty's fault. He'd warned me about Zelda. No use to take it out on him. Well, I went into the loft and made an effort to hold it down. But it was a wasted effort. Matty wouldn't have minded anything I said or did. Matty wasn't even there. Only his body, half covered with the burlap used on the walls to soundproof the joint. He'd been shot once through the head, clawed down enough burlap over himself to make a shroud. I picked up the phone in the office, gave Central the number of Sour Sammy's joint, and waited for Sammy to see if Barney Ricketts was under his favorite table. Barney Ricketts is the only ex-bootlegger I know who went broke in 1922. He set out to prove that a man could drink his gin without ill effects. But he never set a time limit on the experiment. No, Barney hadn't come in yet to Sour Sammy's. Well, I left word for him, meet me at Fat Annie's place. I started to leave. I hesitated and went back to Matty Wynn, spread a clean handkerchief over his face. I made the street three stairs at a time. I crossed the river, jolted the Erskine down Boulder Road to Fat Annie's place. Seemed like a waste of good singing, but Maggie Jackson was getting ready to do her number. I eased a lone drunk out of a booth, draped him on the edge of the bar, and sat and listened to Maggie. Across the river on the Kansas side That's where Fat Annie and the booze abide to get your music and your chicken fried, come to Fat Annie. Just pour a pocket full of rock and ride across the river. To the Kansas side And when you get across That great divide Come to Fat I'm just beat, Pete, right down to my shoes. Yeah, it's a noisy crowd, Maggie. Out-of-town wine buyers with gin chasers. Murder. Yeah, do you want a beer? Thanks, Pete. I could use it. All right. Hey, draw two, will you? Barney ain't been in yet, has he? No. You got trouble again, Pete? Where can I buy a new birthday? The stars are ganging up on me. Ain't nothing in that astrology, Pete. Well, there must be some explanation. Yes or no, hot or cold, I catch it. What's the misery this time, Pete? Only that Matty Wynn caught a bullet in the head. No. And if I'm not out of KC by morning, he's going to have company. Look, Maggie, do you remember a disc I cut for Matty? June night? Sure do. Good session. You got a copy of that one? Right on top of the pile. Where? In my room, just down the street a piece. Well, I'd go with you, Maggie, but I don't want to miss Barney. I'll get it for you, Petey. Thanks a lot. Ah, Pete Kelly, no kid troubadour, bar of the barrel houses. Hi, Barney. 
And Maggie Jackson, canary of the cribs. I'll be right back, Pete. Thanks a lot. Uh, Petey, I've just suffered a great hurt. No sooner did I set foot in Sour Sammy's joint than Sour Sammy himself came a-grinning and a-smirking to tell me with undisguised glee that you were waiting for me here. He was openly delighted to see me go. Yeah, look, Barney. I was sorely tempted to ignore the message, merely to aggravate Sour Sammy, you understand. But since it was you, Petey, and in distress, I'll warrant, I came on the wings of Mercury. Thanks, Barney. Mercury, a... that's a thought, Petey. We've tried ether in our beer, chloroform, and even the tincture of laudanum. Now, uh, what would a soup spoon of mercury do? Uh, no, too risky, unless, of course, one... Barney, listen from... to me, will you? I'm breathing against the clock. Never will I forget Sour Sammy's attitude, and after all, the credit he's given me, too. No, Petey, it proves only one thing. Man is essentially an asocial animal. We band together only because we find it impossible to survive alone. Yeah, I know. But there is no true affection anywhere. Like the wolf, yes, take the wolf, Petey. He too herds, but only in times of want and stress. Yeah. And as soon as he doesn't have to rely upon his fellow wolf for survival, off he goes to prey upon his own. Yes, Petey, like the wolf. Man is a lone hunter, hating the herd because he is forced to depend upon it for survival. You all through? Very well, fellow wolf. Johnny April, Barney, do you know him? Oh, yes, yes. A fine gentleman, Johnny April. Never kills on the Sabbath. Well, I can't wait that long. He gives me till morning to get out of town. Foolish man. Right now, you should be navel deep in timetable. Look, I got sucked into this by his wife, Zelda. She asked me to get a record from Matty Wynn that belongs to her. She told April that I'm trying to shake her down. I got worked over and Wynn got a bullet. What's on this record? I don't know. It's just a disc I once made for Matty. It's called June Night. Why does Zelda want it? I don't know. Why did Zelda lie to April? I don't know. Here's the record, Pete. Thanks, Maggie. And who shot Matty? I don't know. Let's save time, Petey. Just tell me what you do know. Well, all I know is that Zelda's after this record, and she doesn't want April to know it. And that's the copy there? Yeah, June night. I thought we maybe we could spin it once, and maybe it'll give us some kind of a message. I'll put it on the phonograph, Pete. Thanks, Maggie. I'll wind it up for you here. All right, listen to it, Mean anything? Nothing. No hidden meanings or codes or ciphers? Nothing there but the music. Tell me, Petey, how are these things made? What? A recording. Well, you record directly onto a round table of soapy wax, and then they dust this wax with graphite, and they dip it in a copper plating tank. From this, they make what they call a mother or the stamper, and that's what turns out the records that you buy in the store. I see. And the, the wax master, that's always kept in the recording studio? Yeah. 
When you've finished a job, Pete, can anything else be recorded on the master? Well, I suppose you could dub from one master to another, yeah. Petey, when I was a mere lad, my old father told me, when you seek an answer, child, always go to the master. Well, I pointed Barney for the door. We got into the Erskine and jolted back over Boulder Road and across the river. Barney insisted on expanding his wolf-man-herd theory all the way back to Baltimore Street. By the time we reached Matty Wynn's loft, my fangs were on edge. Barney looked away from Wynn's body as we headed for the file room. I yanked open a metal container. It was empty. The master of June night was gone. Yeah, your old father was right, Barney. He also told me the master will always be there for you. Notice the disarranged state of the files here. All the compartments. Yeah. Whoever came for the master of June night went directly to the right file as you did. Didn't find it there and ransacked the rest of the place. Well, then Matty hid it figuring something like this. But where? Let's look around the control room, Petey. Oh, there's no place there to hide a flea. Did you ever read a story called The Purloined Letter by Edgar Allan Poe? Not now, Barney. A wonderful little tale. Now, look, Barney, In some other... In this particular story, Petey, a number of detectives were taking a room apart by the seam, searching for a letter. They couldn't find it. And why? Because man is blind, Petey. He never recognizes the truth when his eyes fall on it. Just as our eyes now fall on this peculiar-looking record on the turntable. Yeah. Barney wouldn't leave it out just like this. Prove me wrong. Play it. Uh-huh. All right. Let's listen to it and see. You understand what you to say, don't you? You want the script for me? Not that I don't trust you, of course. Let's get on with it, Matty. A little closer to the microphone, Zelda. This close enough, Matty? This close enough, Pete? Don't be foolish, Zelda. Put that gun away. Give me the record, Pete. Sure, in exchange for that gun. You'll get what's in the gun. What, you dealt it to Matty? The record here on the turntable all the time, and you broke three nails ripping those files apart? Face the wall. Keep your hands up. Lean against it, both of you. Excuse me, madam, but I just dropped in to make a record for the folks Shut back up. home. Surely. One move, and I'll give it to you in the back. That's my department, Zelda. Johnny! Give me that gun. All right, Zelda. I told you here. I only bought a small piece of your yarn. Now I want the rest of it. I didn't want to involve you, Johnny. I came to pay them off. They killed Matty. See? See there? And I got the gun away from... No good, Zelda. Can't you see his face? He just run out of mileage and ideas. Listen to this, April. No. No, darling. It's a frame. This... Shut up. All right, Kelly. I'm listening, and it better be good. All right. Here it is. It's all on the record. Enough. Huh? Johnny? Johnny. April, don't. Don't shoot her. Johnny, don't. Don't. Please, don't. Get away, oh, no. Back off so I won't miss you. Johnny. Johnny! Johnny! He can't hear you. I should have let him kill me. You fell in love with him, didn't you? Yes, I did. Only one thing I didn't count on. Yeah. You can't dance at two weddings with one heart. Pete 
Kelly's Blues, starring Jack Webb, with story by Joe Eisinger and music by Dick Kapka, scoring by Matty Matlock. The music of Pete Kelly's Big Seven and Maggie Jackson is now available on phonograph record. Ladies and gentlemen, the Red Cross already has allocated more than a million dollars for emergency relief work in the flood-stricken areas of Kansas, Missouri, Illinois, and Oklahoma. The biggest Red Cross job, however, will be rebuilding and refurnishing homes in the flooded areas. Cost of this job will run into the millions, more than present Red Cross resources can provide. That is why President Truman has issued a special appeal to all Americans to contribute generously to a special Red Cross flood fund of at least $5 million. Send all contributions to your local Red Cross chapter. The proceeding was transcribed. It's the Silver Jubilee on NBC. Tonight, one of your old friends is returning to NBC. Yes, there's fun for everyone tonight with Uncle Gildy, that happy, bungling hero of the airwaves, the great Gildersleeve. And later tonight, there's the best in recorded music on Meredith Wilson's music room. Meredith's special guest this evening is Frank Lesser, the composer of Broadway's musical Guys and Dolls. And make a note to hear Dragnet tomorrow with another authentic story from the files of the Los Angeles Police Department. The great Gildersleeve tonight on NBC. Welcome back. Well, he learns kind of late in the game uh, that uh, his friend uh, wasn't quite uh, all he thought he was with this uh, sort of uh, divorce, murder, and remarriage plot. And uh, it was interesting to see uh, Barney Ricketts here as kind of the uh, lead force of uh, deduction here. Uh, in a way, kind of reminiscent of that uh, Screwball Division uh, episode we played uh, a few weeks back for our 650th episode special. I should mention that of the six lost, ep- or I should say five lost episodes between this week's show and uh, last week's, uh, other than Vera Brand uh, rerun, only two titles are known. Uh, that was the Marie Walters story and the young girl, and the mug. But uh, we'll be back in the next couple of weeks with some more Pete Kelly's Blues. We do turn now to listener uh, comments and feedback. And just a couple quickly from Facebook. I enjoy this show from uh, uh, Schubert. And uh, Roger comments, love uh, great detectives. Well, thanks so much for your support and your comments there. Truly appreciate it. You can uh, become one of our friends on Facebook, facebook.com slash radio detectives. And uh, be sure and uh, follow us on Twitter at Radio Detectives and fill out our listener survey, survey.greatdetectives.net. But uh, from Boise, Idaho, this is your host, Adam Graham, signing off.